Counter Narrative News bringing you a special episode on Andrew Tate once more as part of our playlist and series on Andrew Tate and his toxic influence and all kinds of manner of destruction and problems that this is creating amongst particularly our young people, boys and girls, but also young men and even older than that. So I'm bouncing off this article from uh, the Observer newspaper from the 30th of April uh, last year, 2023. The title is Don't Talk to Pupils About Andrew Tate's Toxic Influence, Worried Teachers Are Advised as advised by the Department of Education, by the British state and government of the far-right Tory regime, which we have in power currently. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give, um, I'm just going to quote from the article some examples of uh, Andrew Tate's influence amongst uh, children in our schools. uh, And then I'm going to go on to exploring just very briefly about what the government refusal in addressing this problem is, or perhaps their de facto collusion with Andrew Tate's politics or that type of misogynistic, racist, really kind of like a very naked and ugly capitalist uh, politics and culture. Um, Then thirdly, I'm going to touch upon just the intergenerational problems here. And fourthly, we're going to go into the issue of role models um, for young boys and men in this regard. So to the examples from the article, it's focusing around a charity that goes into schools to do workshops uh, around these issues with primary and secondary school children. So the charity's uh, co-founder estimates that an average class of 30 children will have around eight boys who admire Andrew Tate. Uh, The same leader of the charity says, that they were in a South London primary school recently and students as young as 10 years old knew a lot about Tate's arrest and allegations of rape. One 10-year-old boy said that these women consented to sex because they went back to Tate's house. End of quote, pointing to the obvious issue of just the negation of consent and respect in relation uh, of relationships between or relating to or potentially relating to between young men and women and young boys and girls. Uh, The article goes on to say, in a small church primary school recently, the charity went in to talk to pupils after four nine-year-old boys locked a girl in a cupboard, threatened to quote-unquote F her in the throat and then made her watch porn video clips. The school commissioned this charity to run three workshops with pupils on misogyny and consent, during which a number of boys mentioned Tate and said that they see no problem with his views. On the charity's advice, the school reported the sexual abuse to their local authority, child safeguarding team, but they have received no response. The, the assistant head of a secondary school in South East England asked this charity to talk to her pupils after disciplining a male student for harassing a girl by sending her a barrage of threatening and explicit sexual messages on one occasion whilst, while doing so standing outside of her home. The teacher said that during the harassment workshop, this student frequently mentions Tate, saying, you shouldn't take no for an answer from a girl as that shows weakness, which is a classic kind of... Uh, kind of principle, let's say, of Andrew Tate, in which he advocates to boys and men. She says that she was shocked by the number of young men, seemingly lovely boys, showing the same point of view. Um, So this really, again, I mean, you don't have to be reading the broadsheets and the media to know the extent of the influence of Andrew Tate. You just have to be a little bit eyes open, ears open in our communities, in our schools, etc., to know how influential Andrew Tate is becoming. Uh, myself, in a, in a primary school in West London, uh, just totally racialized migrant uh, demographic of pupil population, an eight-year-old on the autistic spectrum uh, said he, he raised the issue of Andrew Tate, saying he thinks Andrew Tate is a good guy, he's a Muslim, he's converted... So he's a good guy. And uh, this was during a PHSE class on uh, on smoking, actually. And it was because it was because of the smoking and the way Andrew Tate smoked cigars that this eight year old autistic boy of East African heritage disclosed to me, which then I disclosed, disclosed to the safeguarding uh, immediately that he thinks Andrew Tate is a good guy because if you vape, he will smack your face, said the eight year old. And instead, he likes to smoke cigars. So. This really, I think, is connected to the issue of the intergenerational influence that the older 
uh, people in our community are internalizing this type of uh, toxic racist capitalist politics and then are, are, are kind of depositing uh, down the younger gener- generations. So just to go into the, the to go into this a bit deeper, I've got just a special guest here, a close colleague of mine for decades, who's also a professional in education and secondary and sixth form. So I just wanted to ask you if we, we know the extent of influence of Andrew Tate uh, amongst young people and our pupils in our schools. So what's your, what's your reflections on this and why do you think that this, this is becoming such a tsunami of influence uh, for young people? Yeah, well, I think, I think there's a few things. I think on the one hand, Andrew Tate and his kind of ideology, if you can call it that, it is the logical conclusion of the kind of culture of neoliberal toxicity, um, which, which pushes wealth and by extension, the kind of ability to secure sex from normatively beautiful women as the singular benchmark of success and worthiness as a human being. And so he's offering, obviously, he, or he, he uh, pretends to be offering um, a, a kind of shortcut to achieving all of that. Um, but that is, as I say, in some ways, that's the logical conclusion of the mainstream neoliberal uh, culture, unfortunately, which, which schools are, are complicit in pushing themselves, of course. That's always the argument they get increasingly learning has been reduced to getting good grades why do we need good grades to get a good job so you can make money so you can be a successful worthwhile human being so all that's kind of schools are complicit in the toxic culture that has created andrew tate which is why they're a bit floundering in how to deal uh, uh with him i think the second thing is that there is amongst young boys there you know there, there's there's a lot of and again in the culture of schooling is often management, behavior management by shaming kids. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, sometimes that, that's kind of gendered to the extent that there's a lot of female teachers in primary school who are then using that shaming technique on um, boys, you know, who f- maybe perceive that they're unruly, natural boyish unruly behavior they're being shamed for and so on. So Tate's kind of a backlash against that, giving them a, a sort of, toxic version of of pride to kick back against that shaming and again i think that sort of shame is kind of on the increase there are fewer and fewer teaching assistants being funded when i started in the school uh 10 years ago there were you know you'd get normally at least a couple of teaching assistants in a class of 25 30 kids now a lot of social growing social needs growing social problems and and nearly never do you have a teaching assistant in the room so increasingly reliant schools are on that kind of punitive sh- shaming sort of behavior management more, more like a kind of army army tactics really of breaking people down like that and i think the final thing that i would mention the working class are being massively disempowered their lives are being made increasingly untenable cost of living crisis close closure of social uh, facilities leisure facilities youth clubs all of that um, more and more stress uh, in the household and so on but the there's always been a sort of there's been a compensation there's an unwritten contract when 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 the land was first taken away from the peasants in the in the in the enclosures there was a sort of compensation that Sylvia Federici talks about this uh, that that men were provided as a sort of almost a compensation for the loss of their land they were basically allowed to effectively abuse women as as their kind of compensation um, so, um, and that, that's been the kind of unwritten contract. And now I think with obviously women increasingly kind of aware of their rights, less willing to be pushed around that. So there's two things, uh, the class is being disempowered politically and economically, and then that kind of compensation for that, that men used to have by being able to vent their, their anger and frustration on their women, they're in, uh, un- unable to do that. So I think a lot of, a lot of men, um, and then a, a, this misogyny appeals to them because they feel like they're being that they, they had a deal. They're not aware of necessarily the history, but they feel how, somewhere they, they know there was this deal. Yeah, OK, we'll get pushed around by the ruling class, but then we have power in the household. And that was the deal. And they feel that deal's mm-hmm. broken. So that's all attracting people to this misogynistic kind of uh, ideology as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Really, really excellent insightful uh, analysis and critique and, and, and words there i mean it reminds me of the um the the expose of british policing which really parallels all of this toxicity that we're talking about and then then if we're talking about how the ruling classes in these capitalist colonial societies then imposes its rule then you can see that the policing is a major arm of that into facilitating 
uh, and delivering the capitalist oppression. But then that culture of policing is being reproduced uh, through the society at large and by the far right Tory regime itself. So Andrew Tate kind of becomes an ambassador to all of that kind of representative kind of political identity and cultural approach of the state, of the government, of the police, etc. So just to go into this thing, uh, uh, to continue uh, on this thing, and thanks for that. Mm-hmm. And just like to say, like, yeah, we're, we're both professionals in education and people want to, because uh, uh, we're working directly with young people, not only in the formal setting in, in education, the curriculum, but extracurricular activities as, uh, as well. Um, we're having actually independent sessions that are pupil led outside of the formal school setting as well, which are very successful events that Counter Narrative News has been uh, uh, re- re- reporting on. So just to go to, to, to the government refusal, which is really a collusion, as, uh, as to my uh, guest alluded to. So this charity is frustrated that I'd quoted from the Observer. The charity expressed some frustrations from the Department of, uh, uh, of Education who've been advising heads who reach out for help not to encourage discussion of Tate's views in personal, social and health education lessons. That's PSHE lessons, which uh, occur once a week in every classroom. And and the Department of Education, the government is refusing to offer any training or resources on the issue. The teacher from the school that that, that saw the boys basically, you know, uh, kind of enclose the girl into a cupboard kind of a form of abduction and entrapment and then forcing uh, porn and pornographic language uh, upon the poor uh, girl. This, the teacher from this school phoned the Department of Education helpline in March asking for support st- and staff training on tackling Tate and online misogyny. She said that she was told that there was currently no resource or training available and that this is merely another example of a social media trend which will go away. Absolute laughable if it wasn't actually criminal and uh, criminal neglect in its intent and the charity spokesperson goes on to say a few sc- a few school leaders who have we have worked with have said the department of Ed- education's ps pshe team advised them not to discuss andrew tate in schools heads have been told talking about him promotes him but she insisted we strongly believe that only through communication uh, can we beat this another uh, secondary s- uh, school teacher Heather Mary James had more than a thousand responses from teachers on Twitter when she offered to share some very basic and relatively, uh, for, forgive us, but quite surface level PSHE uh, teaching resources about Tate recently. But she said, by not discussing this, we are leaving young people vulnerable to these vile, insidious ideas, unable to recognize them as being extreme and sharing them further. End of quote. Although Tate's arrest in Romania in December brought him into the media spotlight, uh, Still, teachers are saying that boys in school, including including this particular teachers, had been following him for at least a year. She described Tate's ability to groom young boys into defending and championing him on social media as unprecedented. But as my guest is clearly indicating, and as I am, there is a real societal development and context to which this this is turning into a, such a popular movement amongst young people and men, and even even uh, a young. Uh, uh, women and girls. To go to the intergenerational thing, in, in this article in Observer, a male teacher at a small rural secondary school uh, tells the, the, the newspaper that after he disciplined a boy for using explicitly misogynistic language to female classmates and explained that the school had a zero tolerance for that sort of behaviour, the boy's father came in to complain, the teacher said, that the dad said, well, it's just banter and the girls love it, uh, quote unquote. And that again points to how if we are losing rights in society in general, if we're losing access to sports, culture, educational, leisure facilities, etc., uh, et then this kind of, it isn't, but it perhaps can feel towards a sense of filling the gap of disempowerment in trying to then, quote unquote, re-empower in this really oppressive way uh, against uh, against the the opposite sex, as it were, and then if you see the intergenerational thing, now you've got a situation where you have you have parents and their children in the prison system at the same time. Now that indicates a collapsing capitalist society, which can't even in its social democratic phase uh, achieve any kind of semblance of s- stability and functionality relatively that that is just becoming totally dysfunctional so when the Tories are saying look we're not going to assist teachers in addressing this problem in schools of Andrew Tate's misogyny and, and the directly related issues of 
far-right racism uh, and, and openly colonial capitalist views. It's, it's the Tories saying, look, we need this politics to facilitate and to achieve our agenda of, 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 uh, of securing the upper rate of super profits globally and domestically in Britain as well. And they can only do this by ensuring that the working class are in such an insecure and vulnerable and disorganized, divided mess of a situation. And therefore, they can literally just do whatever they want to do, not only get away with it, but then also commandeer uh, whole sections of the working class who internalize these oppressions to actually help them facilitate it. And, and don't we see this totally as well, not only with Andrew Tate, but the weaponization, the, the fire right weapon, weaponization of migrants and asylum seekers around small boats, Albanian community, Pakistani community, and the ongoing criminalization of black communities in general as well. Finally, just want to talk about this issue of uh, role models, because in another uh, article which appears online on the 2nd of January uh, earlier this year in The Independent, entitled Voices I've Seen Behind the Curtain of Men Like Andrew Tate and I Believe I Know How to Beat Them by someone called Sufyan Ahmed. And Sufyan Ahmed in this article talks about the importance of uh, role models. To quote, we need to amplify the voices of these role models who can reach young people and who will passionately argue against the ideology of Tate and others. They can they can inform my generation that values of inclusivity and progressivism are compatible with a strong masculine identity. Tate's star is certainly waning, but there will always be another Andrew Tate. These solutions are needed to prevent a generation of young men being radicalized and falling down a rabbit hole of far-right ideas. Now, early on in the article, Sufyan Ahmed is correct in this article to, to, to argue that really we can't, as, as my guest said, we can't have a punitive and punishing framework in trying to address this because Andrew Tate and all of this far-right um, populist politics, it feeds off of a uh, false sense of rebellionness and opposing authority. So Sufyan Ahmed is correct, but this issue of role models is problematic. First of all, Sufyan Ahmed is correct. There, are, there are hardly are any real uh, counter-oppositional role models of this far-right uh, toxic culture that's uh, spreading across our communities and our young people. But also a role model is not enough. It actually needs to be social movements, political movements of resistance that are developed, that are pupil led, that are grassroots led, that are working class, black working class parents led. That's going to address the entire spectrum of issues that, uh, that, that we're exploring. It's not narrowly just Andrew Tate misogyny. It's not narrowly just the failure of the De uh, Department of, uh, of Education. It's not narrowly just the issue of a lack of role models. It pertains to our entire existence of our society, our entire lived experience, and how we're being oppressed and stripped of what we deserve. Anyway, this is really important things, and I reiterate, we are working on this directly in schools and independently out schools, out of schools with parents and, and, and communities and young people and children in communities as well. We have a lot of really successful events around this where we encourage people to discuss what we're discussing with their peers and their friends and their colleagues, etc., and their families and their children in a spirit of dialogue, but revolutionary dialogue and critique and with a sense of empathy and solidarity as well, which is very important not to... Uh, and we've gone through this in our sessions where uh, some young men come or boys come into our sessions and expressing some sympathy and admiration for Andrew Tate. And uh, we really like engage and uh, encourage the, uh, the young girl participants who are very sophisticated in this regard not to alienate and create an enemy out of that particular uh, young male who's internalized in part some of Andrew Tate's stuff, but be in a spirit of revolutionary solidarity and empathy, but also clear critique as well and revolutionary vigilance going forward. So I hope that's been of some use and that's counter narrative news. Wishing everyone a fantastic day.